We are now live. Three, two, one. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download and 30-day trial today at www.audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. This is Literary Roadhouse. <laughs> one short story, once a week. I'm Anais. Sneeze. I, I coughed and that's going to come through. Okay, okay. We can do it again. I, I think. Okay, and I'm sorry. Okay. Um, let me let me re-record the, um, the ad roll too, just because I've started to wheeze. Here we go. We got this. <coughs> Three, two, one. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download and 30-day trial at www.audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Anais. I'm Maya. And I'm Gerald. On today's show, we're discussing The Velt by Ray Bradbury. But first, before we get started, I need to let you know that Literary Roadhouse is rated PG for occasional potty mouth. We aren't too bad, but sometimes we aren't exactly clean. So if you have preteens or teens you would like to listen to the show, please give the iTunes store a look-see. And we do rate each show individually. And also, I recommend pre-listening to the episodes before sharing. Second, I do need to let everyone know that we have a very, very sad occurrence on the Literary Roadhouse. Kanechi is departing from the podcast. But we wish him all his all the success in the world with his graduation and job search. I really like when the stories we read remind us or listeners of other literary works we love. For example, last week Todd left a comment on our discussion of Constance's Law, which said in part, it actually brought to mind a favorite quote which I kept in my wallet for years. Strange that some of us, with quick alternative vision, see beyond our infatuations, and even while we rave on the heights, Behold the wide, the wide plain where our persistent selves pauses and awaits us. George Eliot in Middlemarch. You know, I need to read that book. Every, every, I, keep, I keep seeing it, and usually when, when certain things pop up, it's a hint that I need to get to it. And Middlemarch has been popping up in my life a lot recently. <laughs> so thanks for the reminder, Todd. <laughs> yeah. It's surprising how, how much, how much the, sort of the, the really old classics keep keep popping up again and again, isn't it? Definitely. Is that it? Is mm. more? <laughs> um, well, if you haven't read The Velt yet and don't want to be spoiled, pause the podcast, read the story, and then come back. So the story takes place in a time when household machines do everything for humans, from brushing their hair to preparing their meals and tying their shoes. The Hadleys live in such a home. Lydia bought a nursery for their children, Peter and Wendy, which projects their children's imaginations into the room, activating all the senses. Lydia notices that lately the nursery is set to a sweltering African grassland, a veldt, and that each time she enters, she can hear a mysterious yet familiar scream and can see African lions devouring a bloody carcass. It concerns her that 10-year-olds should be so obsessed with death, and she shares her worry with George. George confronts his spoiled children, who deny the existence of the Velt at all. George and Lydia can sense resentment from their children, a resentment which originated after they first denied them a rocket ship ride some short time ago. George hires a psychologist who agrees the Velt is a bad sign, and recommends that the family cut off all technology so that the children can learn to live without it. When George announces this to the children, they have a tantrum so terrible, they convince the parents to give them one more minute in the nursery. As the parents pack a bag for their technology-free vacation, they hear their children shouting in the nursery. They race to the nursery to see what's the matter, but as soon as they enter, they're locked in. The lions are poised to pounce on them, and George and Lydia scream in terror, finally recognizing the mysterious scream as their own. The psychologist returns to the house to find the children enjoying tea in the belt as lions eat a carcass in the distance. Wow. <laughs> Gerald? Yeah. Um, Who wants to go first? <laughs> you've already said to me. Um, <laughs> I I enjoyed the story. I enjoyed the story a lot. Um, I like this sort of. 
And he said in, in, in the author spotlight that, that uh, Bradbury said he didn't write science fiction, but it's it's sort of science fiction. It's like, it's not really fantasy, is it? It's, it's, it's horror. Well, I suppose. Yeah, it's a bit like that. But um, yeah, it, it, was, it was, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, very much. How about you, Annie's? I enjoyed it as well. Um, I thought it was really good. There was a few issues for me which we can get into down the line, but overall I really liked the plot, what happens with the characters, and sort of just the sci-fi element of it, even though he would roll over in his grave if you heard me say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what's funny is I actually didn't see it as sci-fi uh, just because the horror element was so much stronger. Um, the sci-fi element was more of just a background for me, but the when I left this piece, I had the exact same physical response as when I first watched that Japanese film, The Audition. I just felt kind of confused and sick to my stomach after reading the story, and I love that feeling. Um, it's There's something very literary about the story, and I think... I, I can't put my finger on what it is, but I get this a lot when I read really, really well done horror, where not only does it make me feel kind of nauseous and, and and left with a feeling of confusion at the end of the story, but frequently I feel like it's very literary. I feel like horror lends itself really well to literary fiction. And this story in particular was really well crafted, and so... As I was reading it, I felt almost compelled to continue reading it. Like, I couldn't stop. And the end, I was, like, blown away because it touched on to so many deeper issues. And that's what I loved most about this story. Yeah, I think so. I, th I think, I think the, the sci-fi, futuristic horror is, is, is the, the superficial story and, and the sci-fi or looking into the future and, and having this house that, performed everything for you is 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 just the, the you know the the top level narrative but there's there's all sorts of other messages that he's getting across underneath that which which I, I really enjoyed and and as I said in um, in the the comments on last week's story I love literary fiction when there's a proper story but and it's my <laughs> my proper story you know it's real life and it's it's um, you don't base laws. <laughs> and that's <what> I <laughs> so I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it's funny, I was listening to an interview that he did. Actually, no, it was a lecture he did in 2001. And he went off on a little bit of a rant about, you know, you know, he's, he's always said writers should read a short story, read an essay, and read a poem every day. And then he went off on this rant about why you should only read old short stories because new short stories have no story. They're all a slice of life. And he's like, have you read the New York Times lately? There's no story there. Just try to get through it. I was cracking up. <laughs> That's very good, yeah. Yeah, I like that, yeah. Um, it's funny that you guys mentioned that the sci-fi seems sort of more like window dressing and that the horror element of it is really the meat of it. But... For me, the sci-fi aspects of it were really important in getting apart his commentary on technology and reliance on those sort of creature comforts because he sort of took um, things that we see today and exaggerated them and then kind of has this cautionary tale. I think the, more, the most obvious one is this cautionary tale of what happens um, when parents let technology raise their kids and you hear people today talking about letting the TV or the computer raise your kids, right? And he's taking this to sort of a really horrible fatal endpoint. Um, so for me, the technology was really important. Well, what's interesting about that is this story was written in, what, 53? 50. I think 50, so, yeah. So yeah. this story felt really pertinent to the experience as a parent today, but all that technology that you mentioned being there today that is a commentary on the technology today, that commentary was not there when the story was written. That's how forward-thinking he was. Like, he he took what was basically black and white TV and extrapolated it onto iPads and virtual reality. Yeah, that's, that's Decades pretty... in advance. Yeah. <laughs> and that is really good sci-fi right there. And I, didn't, and I didn't think it was really window dressing. It's, it's, I, I it's thought background. Was, 
Yeah, it's 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 part of the top level narrative. It's part of the story that you read first time, and then when mm -hmm. you go back and, and read it again, then you look, you see below that, and you 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 see, you know, the other messages he's trying to get across to you underneath that that story narrative. And and yeah, I I love I I read a lot of sci-fi when I was a when I was a a younger man, and uh, and horror too. So yeah. But so then it all came true, and you got over it. Is that what you're yeah. saying? <laughs> No, I, st I still read horror, yeah. Not so much sci-fi. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I think that is a really good segue into talking about what we saw as the themes of the story because I think what you see as the themes of the story may affect how important you see the technology in the story. So, Anais, how did you see... I mean, what did you see as the most, you know, overriding themes in the story that really just knocked you over? Um, so he seemed to have this sort of exploration of sort of self-reliance versus technology, but he's very focused on the kind of technology that he even calls in the story creature comfort. So he's not talking about things that are actually useful for production. It's, you know, there's that line that Peter says where, he, where the father, George, is saying, oh, no more technology. He's like, but what else is there to do but hear and smell and see? Like, I'm just used to having all of my senses tantalized all the time and never actually doing any work or anything else but that. So there was a, there was a lot of commentary on that. And then there was also the thing which the psychologist says pretty explicitly, which is you and Lydia, she was talking to George at the time, aren't doing the things parents are supposed to do. The house is. So it's natural that the kids love the house as if it was their parents, which I thought was kind of, you know, an exaggeration, but um, I guess growing up, I guess I'm a millennial, right, if you listen to all the think pieces, I can kind of understand that, where there is this kind of weird attachment to technology. And how about you, Gerald? Yeah, I, I think I think it's, it's, it's the, the main thing I, I got from it is the, is the idea that they were, um, yeah, they were letting go of, of parenting, um, and like you said, Maya, uh, similar to how some people are today, is stick the kid in, in stick the kid in front of the TV or with the iPad on it on its lap um, to entertain it and and to keep it quiet while you do the things that you want to do. And um, so Bradbury saw this way back in in 1950 and saw that this is how things could be and that the children get spoiled and treat the parents like like dirt um, because the parents aren't important it's the house that's important to them the house and particularly the nursery is is what's important to them and the parents just you know are just people to to um, to shout at interesting see when I was reading this story I actually didn't see the story as being about the technology I saw it as being about the nature of childhood because the technology what does it do it takes away all the things that make children civilized and what are children at their core like we like to think that children are these sweet innocent beings that you know they want to skip in the in the fields and play with their dolls but actually they're horrible torturous animals that want to kill things <laughs> do you say that as a mother everyone yeah. Hey, as a parent who who not only has raised children but was teased as a child, children have a dark side, and all these things that we as parents try to protect our children from, a lot of times are things that come from them, and that we actually make them loving. We teach them how to be kind. We teach them how to behave. And the house removes that parental responsibility and allows the children to be the wild animal beasts that they naturally are. And that's actually what I saw the theme of the story as being. And that's why it creeped me out so much. Like when you see a horror, when you see a horror flick, if there's like a bloody ghost in the corner, you might like scream, you might be creeped out. But if there's a bloody child host in the corner. A, a gruesome child, a lot of times it has a much more visceral effect and I think it's because on a subconscious level we know that all little children want to kill us except we have feed them so they can't. And so, like, <laughs> Gerald, you're, 
Gerald, I see you over there laughing. I am so, like, not even, like, being facetious here. Like, this is how I honestly see children. <laughs> and that's why all the best horror flicks have, like, some scary, creepy child. And so, yeah, that's what I saw this story as being about. And the technology, what it did is it removed the necessity of the parents and it allowed the children to have free reign in the way I read the story. And sort of going along with that, um, there was the Peter Pan reference, because you had the kids being named Peter and Wendy, and the nursery is their mm -hmm. Neverland, which they do not want to leave, hysterically so. So, you know, there was that undercurrent. But as you talk about sort of like the darkness of children, as you know, as you were speaking, I thought of The Laughing Man that we read um, maybe like a month ago now or more, J.D. Salinger's The Laughing Man, and in that one, the kids were dark and were loving the criminal and the grisly killings, but when it came to their own sort of social atmosphere, I mean, to the other Kamachi kids, to the chief, and to their own parents, it was always sort of this sort of like subversive obedience, where at the end of the day, they were still doing what their parents said, but, you know, kind of but rewriting the script of why. They were doing it in a subversive way because their parents yeah. feed them. <laughs> right. Well, because they feed you. They're like cats, is what you're saying. <laughs> that's, that's only more evil. <laughs> Actually, that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I have two cats. I see it in their eyes. But, um, yeah, I mean... I don't know if I would take kids to be that dark in my interpretation of it. Like, I don't think most kids, even if um, they're totally attached to their house that is raising them, would take it as far as killing another person or their parents. Um, Have you read the news lately? <laughs> was there a, a child killing thing? I haven't seen There's that lots while, of but... children killing parents. Maybe you're just reading the good news from not here. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, but... I guess where I was sort of going with that is I, I don't know that the kids being willing to pull the trigger on the death um, is, for me, that wasn't the main point. That's sort of like the fantastical element. Like, I don't, I don't know if the cautionary tale is raise your kids or they'll kill you because they're cats. Like, you know, I no. think... Not, not that I think you're taking it that way, but I guess what I'm saying is... Um, I didn't necessarily see the kids as dark because they're children. I saw them as dark because they're really, like, they were creepy throughout the entire thing. They were socialized very strange. The way they talked to their parents, like, they were like the Shining Twins. And I totally. felt like that was them, you know, not kids in general is what I'm saying. Well, whereas me. the way I read it was, you know, the theme of the story being you actually need to be necessary to your children because this is what happens to them if they're left to their own devices because really children are not sweet and innocent. They're evil. <laughs> These particular children. These particular ones. <laughs> you just say that to make yourself feel better. So how are you feeling, Gerald? <laughs> Any kids in the neighborhood that you want to shy away from after reading this story? Not at all. Not at all. Kids, kids are lovely. Kids are born innocent. Um, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it, it's, 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 it's that thing, isn't it? That, that um, the pet, the, the children just, just tr treated them abominably. And um, you know, they, 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 there was this, this quote that's, um, you know, when uh, da, 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 what's his face, George. Yeah, George says, um, we've given the children everything they ever wanted. Is this our reward? Secrecy, disobedient? Um, and and it's, it, it's sort of, you can see that when, in, in kids in, in our world when, when they're given everything they want and they're never satisfied. They, they always want more. They always want the newest thing. They always want something, something different. And whatever you do, it's not, it's not good enough for them. That's yeah. I'm, I'm saying that my here. So, so, so. Well, I see that a lot because I live in a really high end area, and I don't think it's necessarily the things. I think it's the fact that a lot of times those things are given because the adults aren't present. They're given in exchange for. So, mom and dad work extra long shifts, so they throw things at their children. And I think that. Um, I think that a lot of the negativities of quote unquote spoiled are actually the repercussions of the parents not necessarily being involved. And one of the things that 
struck me as a sub theme because death was really important and it wasn't so much like like when the children finally pulled the trigger I didn't think that they did it in a way of let's kill our parents I think that they had been practicing death in that room and that it felt natural to them because they had been practicing death and so when I say children have a fascination with death that doesn't necessarily mean that they fully understand death they don't necessarily understand that it's permanent they don't necessarily understand all the repercussions but they're fascinated by it whether it's bugs and corpses or you know sneaking down the stairs to see a horror flick they're not old enough to watch there seems to be a fascination there and parents seem to be fascinated with keeping children away from death and so in this room they've been practicing killing their parents and so when they finally do it do they really understand that they did it do they even understand that the parents are real like for a while there about halfway through the story I actually debated whether or not the parents actually existed whether the children had already killed the parents and the parents were just created by the house you know I honestly thought maybe they were some sort of hologram maybe they didn't really exist and so on some level the parents aren't necessarily real to the children anyway so killing them isn't that far of a step and that brings to me the the second theme that really pulled me into the story and that was a theme of what it is to live if you are unnecessary and the, the need for meaning and feeling like you have a purpose in your life because the house takes away their purpose and like the mother says anxiety drinking like all these negative things are happening because they're unnecessary and that to me was was a really strong secondary thing I think I, I think I, I slightly disagree with you on on the the killing of the parents thing because I, I think I think that yes death was part of, of of that imaginary world that they were creating in the nursery but I think they didn't they they weren't planning on killing parents and they didn't they didn't consider it as killing their parents all they were doing is ensuring that they continued to have n use of the nursery and yeah so the, the child parent relationship had broken down and they were just people who who told them to do things that they don't want to do and and so that's what they 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 took that out of the equation and and they they fed, basically fed them to the lions and um literally yeah literally. <laughs> and and uh, and therefore ensured that they could continue doing what they wanted to do so a slightly different slightly different viewpoint than than yours so, Anais, has this story convinced you to be child free for the rest of your life? <laughs> well, I mean, I, if I, I pull that, that with your opinion of children being cats, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, um, yeah, um, well, I wanted to actually circle back to what you were saying about what it's like to live when you don't have purpose. Because there was that part where Lydia was saying, um, maybe I don't have enough to do, maybe I have time to think too much, why don't we shut the whole house off for a few days and take a vacation? And George is like, you mean you want to fry my eggs for me? Yes. You want to damp my socks? Yes. And she's crying through the whole thing. You want to sweep the house? And she's like, yes, oh yes. Because she feels so sort of useless and has nothing to do. And there's this sort of commentary about how you know, work, housework or whatever it may be, um, is kind of part and parcel on what it is to be a happy person in your life. Mm -hmm. I love that line. I really did love that line. It, it, it was very emotional to read it. So doing housework makes you happy. Good. I, I it's that. not so much that, but it gives you a reason to get up in the morning. You know, like I'm home with an injury right now, and if I didn't have my writing or voiceover work, I would probably be climbing the frickin' walls because I would have no reason to get up. I would have no reason to stay up. Like, there's something about having a purpose that makes, that distinguishes one day from the next. If you have no purpose, the days tend to run together and you can get really close to madness. But that purpose, it breaks up each day and it, and it makes it 
it's like punctuation in life. Yeah, we, yeah. we, we, found, we found that once, once we retired because we, we stopped working full time and retired and, and you don't have work. And, and I've heard of a, a number of people who, who retired and then died quite Die. quickly afterwards. Because yeah, that's really common for guys actually. They retire yeah. and then they croak. Yeah. You gotta um, keep you dudes busy. <laughs> So so yes yeah, so we have things that that punctuate our week including podcasts and stuff like that and um but things things that we do that it's 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 just yeah it's just it sounds a bit, a bit extreme having a reason to get up in the morning but but like you say Maya, it, it you, you you need something that that gets you up and gets the day going and um uh, and I, yeah a house like like Bradbury described you you're just going to I just can't imagine, you know, you just sort of sit back and have everything done to you. It's it's weird. You just yeah. I don't I wouldn't know how to cope with that. When did you guys see it, the sense that something was wrong in this story? Like, how early was it that you guys thought, uh, something's creepy here? Well, the first paragraph, I think. Yeah, I think there was a creepy sense throughout, but I think the first time Lydia and George flee the room and the door moves, George sees it move, I was like, oh, there it is. And this actually is a pretty good segue into one of the issues I had with the story, which is um, very early you know that the, th the carcass that the lions are eating is the parents. He finds the bloody wallet, he finds the scarf, the clues are there very early on, and you know like that, okay, it's, it's, it's not an antelope, it's them. Um, and then from the point where you know that to the point where it's revealed at the very end, um, not a lot of other stuff actually c develops. Like, it's kind of like a waiting game. Like, yep, just waiting for the story to catch up with what I know. Like, the, you know, like there's no more... Like, That's I feel just like because I have... you're super smart, Annie's. You didn't figure it out? <laughs> I kind of thought it. I was like, is it really them? Is it not? Is it really? Is it not? Are they already dead? Like, that to me, during that period of time between realizing that it was them and, re and, and then actually happening... To me, I had a constant question of were they already dead or are they, are the children foreseeing their death? And so that's what kept it interesting because I was not entirely sure that the parents actually were real at that point. And so that's what kept me involved in the story. But, you know, you being a genius and all. <laughs> no, I, I didn't see it that way at all. I, I saw it as the uh, her scarf and his wallet were the children giving the lions a scent. So they were... <laughs> Even creepier! <laughs> <laughs> and you get me for saying that children are naturally evil. Come on, you like added premeditation! <laughs> but only once, once they, they'd been threatened with, with losing the nursery. So, so the, the parents are all alive all the way through until, until right at the end when, when the, the doors shut on them and, and they get killed. So that's... Um, <laughs> But it's, but it's, I think it's pretty clear, at least from my reading of it, that in the nursery they were being killed over and over and over and over and over because every time they went in there, there was a scream that was mysterious yet familiar. Like, you know, there was that whole, like, mm, it's you. It's you. <laughs> you know what? I knew that something was seriously up with the story at the beginning when they said that the nursery was 40 feet by 40 feet. And my thought was, Lord of the Flies, you do not give children that much room. <laughs> oh, but the nursery, the whole house, by the way, this was the one thing where I was like, Ray Bradbury, amazing sci-fi author, what a genius, not an economist. Because this whole house was $30,000. Like, hey, what? he read it, wrote it in, what, 53? 1950, yeah, and I was like, um. Back then, houses were, what, seven grand? Like, I talked to people whose houses were seven grand. Yeah, yeah, he's like, this is amazing. I was like, well, yeah, no, that was... He didn't extrapolate the economics. <laughs> I mean, then again, why would you? He got the you? technology right. He got the the severing of the parental children relationship, but he totally missed the economics boat. <laughs> missed it. <laughs> you can't even buy an apartment in most cities for thirty thousand. Well, barely get a car. <laughs> yeah, I mean. <sighs> Oh man, yeah, where I live, a mobile home is six figures, so yeah, it's kind of like, really? Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, this story felt really modern, and what gets me not only is how accurate the technology is, but how accurate the sense of 
the severing of the parental child relationship is like I've seen people who's who literally were just feeding and watering their kids and really didn't have a relationship with their children and the anger from the children you can kind of like sense it pulsating off of them and this story like t to realize it was written in 1950 just blows me away just how emotionally honest and accurate it feels I'm definitely going to read more. I'm totally addicted to Ray Brad right now. Um, well, it's funny because one of my other sort of like things that were niggling at me was I actually found the language or the the storytelling technique to be very kind of talking heads. It could have very easily just been like a play, right? Or like an episode of a show, which later it did become an episode of a show in his series. But it was like very, very dialogue heavy, which mm -hmm. for me, for some reason, I was like, I want more of the mood of the horror of that's coming from this. I mean, it's scary in and of itself. You have this nursery that's going to like eat the parents. Um, but then it's sort of like once you know that, I guess I just sort of wanted more of that a little bit. Not that it made the story... Um, less impactful. I guess I just wanted a little bit more play within the prose. Which brings us to an interesting question because it has been proposed that all short story is literary um, because of the economy involved and the skill necessary to write short story. It's often been said that short story is the most difficult of the narrative forms and I think this is probably our first short story that is a genre first story. Um, a genre short story. Um, it could very well, like, it would fit, you know, it could fit comfortably into sci fi, although I agree with Bradbury that it's horror. Um, and that is, is, I see that as one of the differences. Um, a lot of the literary fiction that we've been reading is very narrative heavy, it's, it's, it pulls back from the characters and with occasional scenes whereas this was much more scene heavy much more in the moment and you know the constant question of show not tell well this story was all sh was all show whereas we've been reading a lot of stories that were all tell and so what are you guys seeing as a difference between this story and the other stories that we've attached so far I, yeah, I think I think this this story is all tell, isn't it? It's 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 the other stories that are, are all show, um, and yeah, it, it is it is more genre than than literary. I think um, it has it has the the subtext that that uh, that you can pick up fairly simply and fairly easily, um, and I don't agree that all short stories are literary. I I can't. Like this, for instance, I, I it it's really bordering on on you know whether it's literary or not. I know he's he's he has written literary fiction, but I, I, this is this is definitely straddling that that line between genre and and literary fiction for me. For me, it's literary. I I would take. I mean, it it brings up concepts that are I think are universal, especially as we move forward and have higher contact with technology. And um, yeah, I, it stands the test of time, which I think is sort of like one of the smell tests for literary. And I um, I like that something that's so sci-fi heavy. With apologies to Ray Bradbury, um, <laughs> you know can still make such... I mean, most sci-fi actually does make really good commentary. And mm -hmm. I think for some reason people were sort of resisting that. And there is sci-fi out there that doesn't really make great commentary either. But this is definitely one that has something to say about society in a few different ways that are timeless. And that makes it literary for me. Yeah. I, I agree with you. You know, it, it's interesting. I feel like a lot of people forget that a lot of older sci-fi is now considered our literary classics and we ignore that you know we like to pretend like genre is something different but when genre when fiction is really good regardless you know when, when it goes deep it's literary to me like even if it's bad as long as it goes deep and it makes me question and it makes me feel on the visceral level and when I'm done reading the story it haunts my ass as long as that happens, to me, that's literary fiction. Because when I read genre fiction, you know, if I read something that is pure story, 
but doesn't ask any deep questions, after reading it, a lot of times if you ask me what I would just read, I couldn't tell you. I'll enjoy it, but I wouldn't be able to sit back and tell you what I just read. Yeah, that that's true. I think I, I, I yeah, it, it's. I'm just thinking of some of the genre fiction that I've read recently, and and it's there is no, there is no real subtext. There's no, you know, there's there's no allegory. There's there's no, there's it's it's just surface story, and and you know, enjoyable for that. Um, and this does does have um, other things that it's trying to say. Um, underneath that, but it, it it's I don't know I, I I it's certainly more genre than than I think almost any of the other uh, short stories mm -hmm. we've read. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it. I, I love the story for a lot of different reasons. It's still haunting me. Like when I think back on it, it kind of gave me like a major creepy element, and um. That is something that I really, really appreciate. Or is it the evil children that are haunting you? It's always the evil children that are haunting me. <laughs> and then I go and hug my children, and I'm so thankful. Because <laughs> my children are evil. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write, I'm so going to write a story now about evil She's children. She's just hedging. She's just hedging against, like, children payback if they listen to this. She's like, oh, no, guys. They know. They know. <laughs> So, Gerald, I actually, as I was reading this, I had a question for you because mm. they said the nursery, it can play on all of your senses, but it's not real. The lions are not supposed to come to life and be able to maw people, but then that happens. So it kind of had a little bit like in the magic chalk where it was like, wait a minute, you broke the rules of the chalk. So they broke the rules of the nursery. Did it bother you or not really? Oh, but um. Good question. <laughs> you just put him on the spot, didn't you, Anais? I was really curious. <laughs> I, I didn't give it a second thought. That's very strange. Um, dun, 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 dun. No, didn't didn't give it a thought. Just accepted that. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's creating these images and and yes. The, Do you think it was because it was done really subtly? Like the idea that the images actually were coming out of the wall, it kind of snuck up on you. Like it was hinted at, and then it was hinted at a little stronger, and then by the time the lions actually came out of the wall, it wasn't a surprise. I I, yeah. and I think also that that the 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 scenes are described really well, and there's 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 a lot of sensory input into the scenes. So there's the smells, um, the sounds, and it's it's obviously creating an experience. It's not like a TV or a a, a group of TVs that that just show images. It, it's it, you know maybe he's he's had something in his head that's like hologram. Based or, or something because it, it creates that whole, you know, living in the world experience, and yeah, it, it's it's just a, a very short step, although a very large step, from from that to having lions eating people. And didn't I didn't give it a second thought? It's, it's I have funny. I have a theory. Ooh, the oh. other stories where you know the magical realism stories that you have been less than excited about. Notice how I put that all nice and politely. Um, yeah. A lot of those stories were stories where you were more distant from the story, and so you were intellectually thinking about the story as you were reading it. Whereas this story, because it was genre fiction, it's because it was very show-not-tell and very scene-based, rather than intellectually thinking about the scene, you were in the moment and you were probably feeling the scene more than you were considering the scene. Does that sound...? Yeah, and, and, and it's... it's it, um... As far as Bradbury was concerned, when he when he was writing it, it's near future, so it's real life, but it's just a little, you know, a few years ahead. Yeah. Um, so it, it's 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 near to real life for me, and um, so I, I I I'm connected with it, and uh, I I can you know I'm there in 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 the locations and with the characters. Um, I, yeah, I hadn't. I hadn't thought <laughs> until and I said I hadn't thought about the the lions coming to life and eating people. It's, it's just yeah. Perhaps perhaps there was an upgrade in the in the software or something. <laughs> it was an upgrade. 
or people, <laughs> humans are just really complex, and we don't yeah. even know why. It could <laughs> just be, just is. <laughs> like the lions. Very strange. I'm going to have to think about that. So I'll come back to you next week and <laughs> tell you. <laughs> wow. Does anyone have anything else that they would like to talk about with the story? Yeah, I just had sort of one question, um, which was, so the first time I read the story through, um, the way that everybody talked, especially the children, but a little bit the adults as well, was so awkward that it was a little off-putting at first. And then when I read it again, I'm like, oh, Bradbury might be doing this on purpose to show us kind of like how weirdly socialized these people are because they depend on technology. And I just wanted to know if that bothered you guys at all or if you noticed it. No, it felt totally natural to the environment. I didn't even notate it as I was reading. Um, the way they talked, the way they responded to each other all felt really natural for the environment that they were in. Um, yeah, I think if I was raised in a house like that, I would probably sound a little stilted. Okay. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it reminded me a lot of the black and white sci-fi um, mm -hmm. TV programs where, where people talked like that and, and they wore plastic suits and and had little flying things around the house, and and it's which makes sense because this was like the heyday of science fiction, wasn't it? Like yeah, yeah. 50s, 60s, 70s, a lot of the best sci-fi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you think it's 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 amazing that for what 60 65 years ago now, wow, 65 years ago this was written. Yeah. How, how accurate. <laughs> How pretty close are we to this? This apart from lions eating people, but but you know what? You could take that both ways. You could say how amazing, how accurate. You could say what the hell took us so long? Because we've been trying to make smart houses since you know the fifties. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I fancy these scrubbers and and all the other stuff. That's, that's yeah. Seen. The the painter. That's what yeah. killed me. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the automatic painting device for the children, <laughs> which is see. crazy because there such things kind of exist now. You know, when you go to the toy store, there are all these like contraptions and machines that children can put a stencil in, and then it will paint a picture. Or they'll put a stencil in, and it will create a face on a doll, rather than them physically doing the thing. Like a lot of the things in this story, maybe to a lesser degree, but we're actually working on inventing. So I'm reading the story, I'm like, oh, this is a huge warning sign. You know, when you've got smart houses and phones that are telling you all this information so you don't have to learn things, and children no longer learning cursive in school, like all those types of things like came up for me as I was reading the story. I was like, oh, Ray Bradbury, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he got that pretty spot on, didn't he? He he saw that way back in 1950. So, yeah, strange. So are we ready to rate this thing? Yeah. Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Ray Bradbury gets a solid five and a half from me. Whoa. I loved this story. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Now, I admit... I'm a little biased because I like horror anyway. I like stories that make me feel really creeped out. Whether it's horror, whether it's really dark literary fiction. Like, I think the nature of humanity isn't nice and fluffy. I think we're all evil. So I love stories that tap into that. And, yeah, it was well written. Made me f queasy for the next three hours. I figure if I read a story and I still feel sick to my stomach the next day, then it was a really good story. So, yeah. Five and a half. I'll I'll give it a five. I, I've I've been writing, <laughs> I've been changing my mind as we've been discussing it. Really? <laughs> well, yeah, because I, I I thought yeah I really like this, and then actually it's not that good, and then oh yeah I really did. So yeah, I like I, five because it's 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 a, an interesting narrative on the top with subtext, um, and I, and I like his style of writing. Always have so yeah. Fine. Now this will be interesting because Anais is the one that had the question that had like some problems with the story. Like when I went through the story and tried to find things I didn't like about the story, I really couldn't find anything I didn't like. But you actually had some questions and some problems with the story. So where are you rating it this week? 
Yeah, I was sort of waffling between a four and a four and a half. I think I'm settling on a four and a half because the strength of the story stuff was great, of itself was great. I did look at the scroll bar once. I was like, okay, got it. It's the parents. Let's get there already. And um, so I got a little impatient and, yeah, a, a little too much dialogue. I think I like a little more play. But a four and a half was still very good, and I want to read more of him. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm very thankful for your voice because when I tried to go through and find things I didn't like about the story or things that caused me pause, I literally couldn't find anything. But you didn't give it a six. No, no, I didn't because my world wasn't entirely changed. The sky didn't open up and the harps didn't play. But, you know, five and a half is about as close as you can get. Yeah. Oh, no, it isn't. It didn't change my worldview. I already okay. think children are naturally evil and that we're the things that creep, make, create good people. So, you know. <laughs> if he convinced me that children are naturally good, it would have been a sex. <laughs> because he would have changed my concept of the world. <laughs> I think for most people it was revolutionary that the kids could be so calculating. Yeah. They're a special case. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I have very good children. Maybe it's because I admitted to myself that they're evil and they needed me. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> so, let me do this. For listeners of Literary Roadhouse, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with 30-day trial to give you an opportunity to check out their service. I've been using Audible since 2008 and thought this would be a great opportunity to help our listeners while also supporting the podcast. You know what's really funny? This week I was cleaning out my closet and I found an old book on tape. Like literally a, it was a it was a collection of cassette tapes that was broken out into like four cassette tapes and I'm thinking I have been listening to audiobooks for a really long time. <laughs> I have probably been listening to audiobooks for longer than Anna Use has been alive. So <laughs> so for this week I'm going to recommend that you take a look at The Way of All Flesh. It is a Victorian novel. It is kind of a commentary on Victorian society. And what I loved about this audiobook is I got it on a whim. I thought it would be stuffy. And it is the most hysterical, amazing satire I have ever listened to. The narrator is amazing. It's um, Samuel Butler. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. So to download your free copy, go to audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. Again, that is audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. Okay, and we missed last week's Bradberries. I don't know yes, how you want to get that in. Yeah. Mm. What did we get? Um, last week we read Constance's Law by Bridget Hardy and listeners, or let's be real, Todd and my mom, super fans. <laughs> We love them. <laughs> when we get t-shirts, they get free ones. They've got to get t-shirts. <laughs> of course. Um, they gave it a 3.75. They were really? wrong. They were wrong. They were wrong. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. That's much lower than we gave it, huh? And the weird thing is, when I saw their ratings, my mom gave it lower than I thought she would, and Todd gave it higher than I thought he would. I'm like, mm. they're just sort of converging. They're going to become one super fan. I, I looked at their comments and I thought, you pretty much liked it. And, and why have you scored it so low? I don't understand. But anyway. <laughs> I, guys, I just discovered something. Gerald is Bridget Hardy. That's his yeah. pseudonym. Oh, you found me out. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, very interesting. Yeah, I'll, I highly recommend going in and taking a look at the comments, adding your own comments, rate this story. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow. It's time to choose next week's story. Ooh. I'm hosting the game. What are you guys playing for? You know what? Since we're down one person... How is it that I keep losing? Dang it. I am determined. I don't care if I have to submit every single Chimamanga Adeshi Adesh, story that she's ever written. We are going to read one. Darn it. <laughs> so I am resubmitting Olakoi by Chimamanga Ngozi Adeshi. And for me, it's Jack London to build a fire. Ooh, I like Jack London. Ooh. Mm. Ooh, Which is going to be one of you to win. So we're playing a game I'm calling And Your Little Dog 2. If any of our <laughs> listeners... 
Wait, no, I <laughs> you have to say that with the right voice. And your little dog, too. <laughs> you guys are going to be doing that. The shame is on you. So, if any of our listeners um, listen to Ask Me Another, they'll recognize the game pattern. I took, I made up my own questions and got my own phrase, but the way that the game works is um, I'm going to give you a clue to a word that starts with D-O, and then you're going to say, and your little, what that word is, too. So, for example, if I said, an ornamental paper made of lace, uh, no, an ornamental paper or lace mat preferred by grandmothers to display beneath cakes and potted plants, you would say, and your little doily, doily too. You have to say the whole phrase. Points for you getting in You realize I fail at Jeopardy, right? The whole, like, <laughs> rephrasing the answer thing. You well, just <laughs> beat me. <laughs> Most of it is common nouns, but there could be names, names of people whose names start with D-O. So okay, fun. why don't we just give afraid. up now, Gerald? Let's all read your story. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have to play the game. It's the rules. Ah, we have to put up the charade. <laughs> we do. Plus, One of these days. I want to hear you guys say, and your little dog, too, in character. So, <laughs> Maya, let's start with you. Oh, God. Okay. A widow with a title or property inherited from her late husband. And your little dowager too? Your little dowager too. Good job. Yes. Hi. You got one point. One hey, Gerald. Point. <laughs> yeah, racking it up. Gerald? Yep. A bell rung by visitors to announce their arrival. Sorry. Um. <laughs> the ghosty Adashi, <laughs> and your little doorbell too. And your little doorbell too, <laughs> Gerald. Right now. Oh, you sick yeah. them. Come on. <laughs> oh, I protest. Yeah. You know what? I don't believe you really lost. I think that you were taking pity on me because I haven't been winning any stories. And the last time I won a story, we didn't get to read my story. I think you were just faking. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to let the audience believe that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Maya. Your so question. next week, we will be reading... Well, that's that's be Gerald's chance. Huh? There's a few more questions. Gerald could have a comeback. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. He could. You have a question. I thought the game was over. <laughs> On two questions. How is that fair? <laughs> <sighs> okay. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Maya was just... Yeah, no, calling it in. So okay. <laughs> she, she was hanging up the mission accomplished banner. <laughs> <laughs> in a world. <laughs> in a world. Okay. So, a business and real estate magnet famous for a casino chain, firing celebrities, and questioning Obama's birthplace. Sorry. Don't know that one. Gerald, can you steal? And your little Donald Trump too. And your little Donald Trump too. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but you're still winning, Maya. <laughs> okay, Gerald. A triangular fin on the back of a fish or a whale. Uh, and your little dorsal fin too. And your little dorsal fin. Maya, if you get this question right, you win. If you don't, and Gerald steals, tiebreaker. Or even if way to add it. the pressure. Thank you, Anais. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Why don't you just really shake feel. my head and clear it like an etch a sketch? I think, you'll get this. I think you'll get this one. So, a legendary Spaniard, famous for his seduction of women. Dang it, I know this, and I can't remember. No, Gerald, can you steal? 
And your little Don Juan too. And there your you little Don Juan. Sorry, oh dear. Okay, <sighs> Maya, so if you get excited. this, if you get this in tiebreaker. Okay, a ring okay. shape. A ring shaped hey, powdery. Just a second. It's his. It's his. Oh call yeah. That was my question. Right. That's right. Yeah. You okay. gotta give him a question. That's right. His question. But if he gets this, then he wins. <clears throat> okay. Okay. A ring shaped powdery pastry. And your little donut too. And your little donut too. Ah, well, at least I get to read Jack London. I like Jack London. Yeah. I used to live where he in the same town, and there was a lot of museums and beautiful places near there. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, I just cannot win. Can't win for losing. You felt the win. Though. Maybe you next felt... year we'll get to read some Chimamanga Adachi. Yeah, I read Purple Hibiscus. I've said it before. Everyone should read it. Mm -hmm. well, don't forget, I'm I'm going on on uh, vacation soon, so you got a chance to win then. <laughs> Did you know what I'm say? As long as I'm here, I'm unbeatable, Maya. I know. That's what I, think that's, said. I think that's what I just heard. I well, know. you know, eventually I when I leave, you can read one of your stories. Because <laughs> when I'm done dominating. So oh, I love you, oh, Gerald. Oh, where's this hole that I got cool into? <laughs> okay. Okay, so what are we reading again, Gerald, to make sure I don't mess it up? We're reading Jack London to build a fire. To build a fire, Jack London. Mm -hmm. To join the discussion, visit literaryroadhouse.com. I also encourage you to leave a quick iTunes review. It, tell your favorite, and tell us your favorite short, I'll do it again. To join the discussion, visit literaryroadhouse.com. I also encourage you to leave a quick iTunes review and tell us your favorite short story so far. Your reviews encourage us and help others to find our podcast. Don't forget to tell your friends. And until next time, read a good story. Da -da.